Well, um, now you can see uh, just the enthusiasm that John brings uh, to this and uh, certainly something that's appreciated and a lot of lessons that we can learn to, uh, from John and from his colleagues in Scotland. I think there's a couple things that John and I share in common. Uh, personally, I think uh, second is the first loser. And uh, as you can see by John, uh, he uh, tends to uh, drive change. And the reality is he drives change because he's passionate. But he's not just passionate about what he's trying to accomplish. He's seen the success and he knows that if we can get more people on board to think a little bit differently and not forget about the good things we do, that we can actually create a lot of change. So I want to start by thanking each of you for being here. And I mean that with a lot of sincerity because I think obviously your organization has the value that you can come home and bring some of this stuff home, take a little bit of what you're being shown from every different presentation today, and maybe think just how we can change what we're doing. Or can we do it a little better than we currently are? What I'm going to do is I'm going to change my presentation up. So those of you that have seen uh, my presentation uh, that I've given, I think over a hundred and some times, uh, right across the country, coast to coast, uh, because a lot of it is a combination of what we do in uh, PA and what has been done in Glasgow, uh, what John has spoken about, I'm going to take it to a little bit of a different view with a little bit of a 30,000 foot level, but more importantly, kind of honing it in. And I've combined two presentations that I've done. Uh, one was for an international business group uh, on innovation, and the other one was a combination of what we do in the hub and core. Just to kind of show you the synergies and the relationships that we're talking about when we start to think a little different. Not only that, my deputy chief here, Troy, and uh, Al Nunn, who uh, is a superintendent of schools that went over to Scotland with us, uh, they said, come on, McPhee, we don't want to hear that again. So, long story short, uh, I was told by Jan to start with a bang, end with a bang, and keep the bangs close together, and that's what we'll try to do. So, as I mentioned to you, I'm president of the CACP. I've been across the country speaking on the economics. When I took over the CACP, we were engaged, and one of my priorities was going to have an economics of policing discussion. And that basically has been from coast to coast, started in the, uh, Toronto, went into the Maritimes, been to BC, been through Saskatchewan, all over the place. But one thing that I learned after the first meeting is we need to change the topic. Because the reality is it isn't economics of policing, it's economics of community safety. And community safety isn't just about safety, but it is about the health and the wellness as we discussed earlier from the earlier presentations. So when we did that, I think we really, really opened some eyes, not only a policing profession, but some of the other agencies that have come into here. And I think it's real important to really thank the folks from health here today, social services, education. Uh, I noticed uh, uh, the various uh, Grand Councils and First Nations representation and the NGOs and the CBOs because truly, if we're going to get this done, it's going to be done together. If you think that you're going to solve some of the issues that we're going to be facing in Saskatchewan in isolation, I hate to tell you, but it isn't going to work. And I can tell you that as a professional that's been across the country, uh, that's been now nationally and internationally, and the reality is doesn't mean what we're doing isn't good. Please don't take that as an insult. It's what we're doing is we're going to talk about innovation, focusing on the things that we already do good, and then put some innovation in around how we can be better. And I think John has hit that in spades, and I, and I think I'll try to you'll hear a lot of uh, recurring things. I've got this presentation. If we have time, I'll give you our hub and core update. I've loaded it. Uh, the IT uh, staff has graciously loaded on here. And uh, if we have that time, I'll, I'll kind of give you an update just on what that has uh, made to Prince Albert and Saskatchewan. The thing that I would talk about, as I mentioned, this isn't a police presentation. And I think in policing, the one thing that I really, really would emphasize is we're pretty good at leadership but we're not real good at ownership. We tend to be the first to respond, and when we're the first to respond, we tend to think that we need to own the problem. And we start owning stuff that really we have absolutely no clue on how we can solve. But others will probably let us take that ownership, because what we end up doing is we get into a debate who's going to pay the bill. And that's fundamentally wrong. And I think if we get past that, and what's what I'll talk about today, is how do we get past that? How do we look about not who pays the bill, but how we can collectively solve the solution and then obviously sort that stuff out later. So what in essence I'm talking about is innovation. A little background on myself, <clears throat> how we got to this. <coughs> we started 
I was taking a police leadership, executive leadership course put on by Boston University uh, with Harvard instructors. And what that did is got me putting pen to paper. And this is the business plan. This one says draft 18. I think as John said, we're, we're in a living plan. It's probably in draft 32 and it's a lot bigger than me. We've brought in people a lot smarter than me to take it to the next level. But the long story short is what Boston gave me was the ability to get off the dance floor and onto the balcony and work on the business rather than in the business. Because each of us are inundated with what's coming through the door, we're dealing with crisis, and at the end of the day we do not have time to look out from the balcony and realize there might be a better way to perhaps do what we're doing. The second thing, and you'll see a lot of relevance to this, is I'm an entrepreneur. Been an entrepreneur for about 10, 12, well probably 15 years now. Uh, up until about a year and a half ago, I moderated a group of entrepreneurs in Saskatchewan, anywhere from 5 million in sales to 250 million in sales. And I don't tell you that because Really, that's irrelevant. But it isn't irrelevant when it makes us look at things through another set of lenses. And that's what I'll try to bring in relation to this presentation. One of the things that also was a lens for me that really opened my eyes about a little over three years ago was when I accepted a position from the Premier of the province to participate on the health board. Because at the end of the day, what I start seeing is, wow, are we working in silos? Not that health isn't doing a lot of great things, policing's not doing a lot of great things, social services, education, we're all doing great things. The reality is, what we're talking about is, what I've seen with that other set of lenses, wow, there's some innovation and some tweaking we can perhaps do to do things a little better. And it's all about experiences in life that are that aha moment. The thing that makes you buy in, the thing that gravitates to change. In 2004, I was fortunate to be chosen to go into the Governor General's Leadership Conference. And I'm just gonna go through this real quick just to set the stage. Because this is, I think, the point where I realize that we have to look at things differently. It was a leadership and diversity course, 200 people from across Canada, it was an interview process, I didn't even know what I was applying for, quite honestly when we did it. Uh, my group was chosen to go to McGill and study the area of Montreal. And in my group I had the CFO of the Globe and Mail, Vice President of Suncor, Vice President of the Bank of Montreal. It was a who's who in the zoo. But the reality is, is what the course told us is leave your titles behind. Think about it as if you had influence in talking about your friends and your neighbors and using the abilities you have to create change and find a better way. If you were starting from scratch, how would you change it? How would you make it better? Would you take everything that we're doing now and look at a budget report and say, hey, we're great, we're doing a great job, that's how we measure it? Or would you use the knowledge and the expertise to think of how we could tweak and innovate? So one day in that governor, and I mean this was, our uh, chair was Paul Demery Jr. He's the uh, owner of obviously a power corp, one of the largest corporations in Canada. Romeo Dallaire was there, you might have heard his name. Guy Laliberti, street clown to billionaire. Uh, we had Desmond Tutu, uh, the Aga Khan, you name it. You got stuff that there's absolutely no way that you could have paid for the trip. So we go into Montreal and we're going to study about what our group is going to do and leadership and diversity and how could we do it different. We wake up at 7, or exactly, I think it was 5.30, and McGill, we get on a bus for 6.30 for a 7 o'clock meeting. And we go to the boardrooms of Power Corp in Montreal. And they tell us that obviously Denny Arcan, famous film director in Quebec, tells us the real issues in Quebec aren't language. It's about culture and how we protect the culture and we protect the identity and the actually before we can start to solve the issues we better have to understand what the issue is instead of trying to put our own opinion on what the issue is. Pretty good, good stuff. We go from there to 9 o'clock and we go meet the CEO of Just for Laughs, a program that you might have seen on TV. And he tells us that you know life is serious but you know what, laughter is the university language and smile is the thing that we can often share and you know what, although we work seriously all the time, we should laugh a little bit because if we don't, why the heck are we doing what we're doing? Feeling pretty good about our day, but ready to retire about that time. We go from there, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, we go to uh, grade 11 students, Vincent Massey Collegiate. And Vincent Massey Collegiate, can consider the, uh, the titles and the names that you had at that thing, they had three grade 11 students speak to us. 
East Indian girl. Told us about the challenges of immigration, how her family moved over and how it was really tough for her. You know, discrimination and how their family had to go through that, how they were in a house and they couldn't get out, etc. And, and, and she was very, very powerful. Then they brought a Chinese boy up. This kid was a pretty good speaker, talked about Spider-Man, Peter Parker. With great power, or with great, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And he talks about how the people in positions of power, when they make these decisions, need to understand how it affects everybody within that circle. And then the kid that comes up, and I go, wow, as a grade 11 student, an Italian boy. And he talks about how he's not going to be the new next uh, prime minister, how or he's, his family is uh, from Italy. But what he talks about is how the difference in leadership is going to be going forward, is you have to have an academic understanding. You have to have how those pieces how understand how they go. But you better have an intellectual understanding on what it is going to do to impact your community. And if you can combine those two things, then you will be a force to be reckoned with in creating change. And everybody sits there and, wow, this kid is going to be the Prime Minister. Actually, we, need, we were talking about this as a group. Maybe we should go and figure out where he is right now because he was a pretty bright kid. So we leave there. We take a real quick trip and we go to the Canada Space Centre. And we meet Mark Garneau, first Canadian astronaut. Tells us the real time the stuff in space we're seeing, we're looking at the moon in the real time center. And they talk us about how the Canada space arm and, and Canada has a niche in space. And that niche in space is actually leading, cutting edge stuff. And he talks about <coughs> how we got there. And then he told us to be an astronaut, you had to be an engineer and a doctorate and then a couple other degrees and I knew I wasn't gonna be an, uh, an astronaut. But at the end of the day, you went feeling pretty good. Wow, what we just seen. So we go from there at 4 p.m., we go to a homeless shelter. And we see two 11-year-old kids living on the streets of Montreal. And their dog's there. And they don't have a home. And they don't have a family. And they don't have anybody that's looking after them. They're living on the streets and they're in a homeless shelter. And you think, maybe we haven't quite got this right. We're in Canada. And then that night, I was serving hot dogs and homeless to the street workers at 2 o'clock in the morning. And it was all about leaving your titles behind and then we went and we had a debate how we could change that. So I say that to kind of give you a bit of a background because what we're talking about innovation, when we talk about innovation, really we're talking about leadership. And if you think of injustice and you think in the things that we're dealing right now, there's two things that you can take to the bank from my experience. There's going to be crisis and there's going to be change. And how you manage those two things will dictate the type of leader that you are. And if you don't do it very well, there's a chance that you probably won't survive. And when you're talking about leadership, if you're a leader that can't create followership, I always use the analogy, a leader without followers is simply a man or a woman out for a long walk. It's a dead end. And when you see John's enthusiasm out here, he started with a dream. And we saw John and we went to Scotland with 11 people, senior managers of social services and health and education, my IT manager, my bylaw manager, policy analyst from government. We took a who's who in the zoo from our community. And we saw John's passion in all of them. And really that's what it's about is leadership. Thinking differently, how can we lead this to a better place? And really when we talk about that, we talk about real cost versus benefit. And if you think about this in Canada, you have all heard this analogy very frequently. Every municipality in this country is fighting for what right now? Infrastructure money. They're fighting to improve the roads, their bridges and everything else. But is that same importance or urgency put onto the social costs, the, the marginalized capacity, the families, the things, the generations that are being lost. And really, if you put a dollar on those, which is going to be the one that costs you more money in the long run? You fix the infrastructure, $20 million once. You don't address this. You think of the multiples. You think that this grows five times faster roughly in Saskatchewan than the domestic economy. If we don't start paying some attention to this, and I'll give you some real stuff, it's going to get worse before it gets better. So how do we move to change the argument from expenditure to investment? Because they're two different philosophies. Expenditure is something that everybody wants to cut costs, they want to run lean, they want to run efficient. Very good. 
But investment is that thing, if you have enough money as an investor, you put a little away for a rainy day, and if you invest in the right time, you'll have more money when you get to the right place. But if you don't invest, what happens when you want to retire in 20 years? It's not good. So, what I'm talking about here, crisis, change, investment, and through every thing that we know that there's going to be stormy waters. But how we get through this and how we get through this most effectively, as you can see with a storm or a crisis brings opportunity, but it all depends on the lens that we put on it. If we look at that through a social services lens, we may look at it like this. If we look at it through a policing, it may be even narrower than that. But when we collectively put all those things together, you see the whole picture, and now you can create the change at the right time. And I'll get into that. And then when you add the private sector, going back to what they do well, and the public sector, what we do well, measurement, academia, making sure things are based in evidence, private sector on the bottom line, make sure that we're doing things. And when you put those two groups together and you find the sweet spot, what you do is you find the focus to create change. And then what you do is you enable change to take place. And this is an area where we're talking about the hub and core and some of the things that are John are doing is we're talking about smart money. I've been across the country and I say two things, or a couple things here that I've been saying over and over. We got to get out of the political debate, which some put it hard on crime is what it's referred to. Arrest and incarcerate. And then we have soft on crime, which is another analogy for intervention and prevention. And the reality, what we're talking about is smart on community safety. Because if you don't invest in both parts of these, if your business in both these areas, whether you're in health or you're in social services and you're policing, there's absolutely no way you're going to maximize your returns. So what we're talking about is building a system, an IT system, which I, again, I won't have a chance to show you based on time, but when you put all that intelligence, Jerry talked about it today in relation to enabling, government being the enabler to make sure that data protects privacy, but more importantly, allows us to do our job better, and that's what we'll do. And when you put that all in, you tend to make the right decisions for the right reasons, because it's based in evidence. It's based from best practice. It's based on what it is to drive your bottom line. And I would argue with you that most of police communities across this country don't even know what drives their calls for service. And what I mean by that, when we look at our calls for service in Prince Albert, when Troy and I started to dearly dig into this, 73% of our calls are not criminal in nature. 27% of our calls are criminal in nature, 5% of that 27% lead to criminal charge. So should we be focused in another area? Why is it that our system is generated that we let people go into the system and then we tell them how to fix them and we spend no time trying to take them out of the system before they're actually in it? Because we know they're headed there. There's absolutely no guesswork in this, it's science. So when we went to Scotland, we went there for a few reasons. First of all, they had 15 key indicators that are exactly the same as ours. High alcoholism, knife violence, gangs, I could go through them. In my other presentation, we go through every one of them. But when we had to have $30,000 to do that, what did everybody question us on? Why are you using money to go to Scotland? Because that's an expenditure philosophy. How do we turn that into an investment philosophy? Because that $30,000 is probably already saved us 10 times of what we're trying to do in relation to making our community safer, without a doubt. But that again was the first question that I had to answer when we got back. When I also got back and I presented for the first time to the Prince Albert Gong Council and a bunch of the chiefs there, all of which are friends of mine, I basically said we went to Scotland 15 key indicators and when we got back I said, you know what folks, our issues are not First Nations. Our issues are marginalized people. 
I got challenged by one of the First Nations leaders, and he says, Chief, it's, and I'm Métis in background as well, he challenged me and says, Chief, and he says, it's one thing for you to come up and tell us as First Nations how we have to do it. And I said, Chief, in all due respect, I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm showing you in Scotland 15 key indicators, white homogeneous society, very little movement, high First Nations our, uh, population in our particular area, all the same key indicators. It's telling you that it's about marginalization. And until we get that proper, then we can start getting the things to solve the issues that we do. And a couple of the other chiefs jumped on board and he said he's right and we have to go that way. And it's been very, very positive ever since that. P Prince Albert Grand Council is in our hub and core. They're a real key, uh, key player in relation to what we're doing. And I just want to differentiate. I didn't say there wasn't cultural solutions. I said the issues aren't based on race because there is cultural solutions. So, as I say, investment. The other thing that we learned from Scotland is we need to partner with academia, and we need outside academia, because if we're gonna really do this right, why would we measure our own data? That's pretty easy to manipulate. If I wanna adjust crime stats, I'll change how we report crime stats. That's simple. As Bob Moore and Deputy Chief in Regina can tell you right now, crime stats in Canada right now aren't measured the same. And that's not acceptable. And as the president of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, we need to change that. But it's one thing to say Toronto's crime's going down, the majority of the population is over 50 to 65. The majority of the Saskatchewan population is under 25. We need to use the measurement that fits the time of the day to make sure that we're doing the right things all the time. And really it goes back to it. where do you invest for your tipping point. If you invest early, and it's been said under three, I'm uh, speaking at a literacy conference in Winnipeg next week, talking about the importance of literacy, but the reality is, is back to the same investment principle. Put the smart money in, keep doing what you're doing because you can't forget about the day-to-day -day business when you're doing it, but let's throw some smart money on this on the other side of the house to create the balance on community safety, to create the smart on community safety versus the reaction on community safety. Safety. And when we do this, we have to look at the anomalies. We have to look at the difference between a Moose Jaw and Prince Albert. We have to look at the difference between a Regina and Saskatoon or any comparison in a province. But more importantly, you have to look at the differences between us and maybe Ottawa because that's another level of government. And to do that, if you want to read a good book, read The Black Swan, because it's all about anomalies. And it's about using innovation and where we can tweak that. Policing has the ability to act local. It's one of the few that do. Social services is provincial. Health is provincial and federal. I've sat in the board, I mean, and education is provincial. Doesn't mean they don't do some good things locally, but the largest part of their mandate looks from a different perspective. So if we're really going to impact change, we have to give the ability for the agencies to act at a local level, because if we act at a local level, now we can start solving local issues. Now we can start solving the anomalies. When I was speaking in Iqaluit here about three months ago, there was extremely big time similarities between Nunavut, Northwest Territories, Yukon, Saskatchewan, Northern Manitoba, Northern Newfoundland, Alaska, and Greenland. So if we're really going to look at those things, maybe we've got a group there that we can benefit sharing information, sharing best practices, looking at some of the great things they're doing in Yellowknife. We don't have to reinvent the wheel because a lot of the work has been done. What we need to do is put a structure in place that we can do it properly, and that's what we're talking about relation the hub and the core. But if we're really going to determine net public value and you put that in an entrepreneurial's brain, it's simply value minus minus costs. Things we produce and accomplish cost to produce. If we don't invest properly, there's no chance that we will succeed. If we use innovation, back to the innovation or the, uh, the entrepreneurial brain, and uh, this stuff I learned when I was uh, at the Edward Lowe Foundation, and this was a unique situation. And they took us for three days and they basically tried to break you down and 
I don't know what it is exactly, but it, it, it's a foundation. Edward Lowe was the guy that invented kitty litter. And what he d did is he wanted to basically generate the second generation of entrepreneurs to help drive the U.S. economy. And, and he felt that if you could understand how you are a part of the bigger picture, that you could start solving this. So innovation is an idea or a new invention plus your idea notice, plus the energy and resources to move forward. If you don't have either one of those, there's absolutely no way you'll be successful. So this is where we got started, and this ties into David's story, but this is Joe, because we were so inspired, the 11 of us, when we got back, we started, we'd build Joe, and this is part of our original presentation. Let's look at our system now using a real life kit. Joe, and the name and the year has been changed, but. He's born in PA, alcohol, domestic violence, moves to foster care for a short period of time, parents drinking domestic problems, mom hospitalized in a car accident, alcohol involved, kids vote moved in with grandma, parents went through alcohol treatment, kids moved back with them, brother being violent and suicidal in school, and then wow, wham. Mom stabbed father to death, Joe witnesses this. These are the teacher's notes. This young fellow was in seven schools in nine years, just for the record. This, before this happens, teacher says, this young fellow is happy and energetic. This happens. This young fellow is having trouble remaining on task in class, seems very sad and hardly doing anything. The year after this, he's got extremely angry and aggressive behavior. Go figure. Every one of us knows it's a learned behavior. You know, the beauty of that is some teacher was trying to solve that problem and had absolutely no idea this, this happened. How would they? Who would share that information with them? How would a teacher know the whole problem? Again, some problems with that. And what I'm using here is information that we collectively put together to look at how we can make the system better. Not to point fingers or lay blame. That stuff's passe. That's old. That doesn't work anymore. If we want to blame health or police or social services, we got to get over that. Because at the end of the day, we're all trying to make ourselves better. Mom plays children at, mom goes to jail, Joe referred to counseling and mental health, never given follow up by caregiver. Oh, gotta go back to that one. Because this is a good one. Grandma called the office three times and said, can't make the appointment. What did the counselors think? Grandma's got it under control. They don't need our help. The family's got this looked after. Nobody did give this young fellow any follow up. Again, not blaming, just looking at what's in the evidence. Kids moved back to ground because of money conflict between family members. Mom moved out to jail, lived at Wiley with see with kids. Mom was drinking breach parole. Kids moved to grandma. Joe's brother sexually assaulted his sister. All moved to foster care. Unfortunately, this happens too often. It's again systemic, a larger issue. Mom released on parole, completed alcohol treatment. Kids moved back with her. Mom drinking breach parole. Kids placed to foster care, trial for sexual assault, refused to testify, charge of state. Again, unfortunately, no supports in the system to give that young family what we need to do to get a positive outcome. Mom released to jail. Mom back to jail due to drinking. Kids placed with grandma. Mom released on parole. Mary's a murderer in prison. Kids move back with mom. As you can see, the environment just keeps going. Joe misses school, anger management problem, problems with YO. Now we're involved. So what does that tell you? The kid's 12. Because the police are involved. Because that's when the police can deal with things legally at 12. Now there's violence between mom, sister Joe, social service, and police involved. Mom's new husband released from jail, halfway house, ongoing violence between them. No food on home many occasions. Kids not attending school on a regular basis, why own ball, Joe in jail, kids placed with family, mom lost parental rights. <coughs> that is the information from health, social services, and education. Let's put the policing component to this. Because we've spent a lot of money on trying to work smarter in relation to information technology. And we've got some pretty good stuff in relation to that. So this young fella comes on our radar screen when his mother was involved with possession of stolen goods. Go figure that. He was doing the break and enters to give mom the fence to fence the property to support the drug habit. Correlation, relationship. Did we know that? No. What did we do? We laid the charge. Done. Got her done. We're out of there. Back to John's point. Then this young fellow was charged dangerous operation of motor vehicle, and he was a suspect in MVA, charged break and enter, then he was charged dangerous operation of motor vehicle, then he was a victim of a robbery, living the lifestyle, then he was charged with criminal justice act, mom attempts suicide again, family spiraling, then he was charged robbery of the firearms, then his family was evicted from housing due to drug and gang, or gang and drug use, charged shoplifting veil violations, charged willful damage, charged escape. How's the system working? 
You know, and let's not take that and say that I'm blaming the system again, that's passe. But the reality is, is there another way that we can look at this? The system is what it is. We need to use the system and we need to be able to play better within the system to get the maximum outcomes. And what I mean play better, we need to understand what it is that we need to do. A good friend of mine and a colleague that I've got to know over the years, and he's a former Chief Justice of one of the provinces, says the system is full He's got 90% poor souls, and I won't use the other analogy because I don't, and it's 10% blank holes. And what he says is we need more information on the 10% and we need less of the 90% in the system because they don't belong in the system. How true. Charge Youth Criminal Justice Act 2, charge fail to appear, charge escape custody times 2, assault police officer, obstruct public police, and wham. That's the knife he used to take another young fellow's life, right out of our exhibit locker. Now the question to all of you as professionals, do you think there's an intervention or two that could have been done in there if we would have shared the information instead of trying to deal with this poor young fellow in isolation? I think we all know that answer is quite easily yes. So can we do it better? But let's go a little further. This is back to John's diagram. This is our diagram where this young fella grew up. That greenhouse is where he lived. All those red dots are a two, that's within a two block radius in our city and all those red dots have somebody living in those homes with multiple criminal code convictions. We had to draw the line at multiple because it was a red blur on the screen. Bit sad, but it's real and it's true. So if we could do that better as a police service, maybe we should have had some services in that particular area a long time ago and we would have did a better service to those citizens in that area. Back to if it's predictable, it's preventable. John has said that, I've said that. Let's just think three and a half years out, four years ago, we were told that, you know what, we're gonna lose two thirds of our staff. At the end of the day, you might not be able to go home, make sure you have sports at home, because at the end of the day, we were gonna hit with a crisis, because what was coming, the H1N1 was coming. And the H1N1, what they did is all the agencies got together and they showed us, you know what, if we just collaborate on this, shared information, we get a common plan, we make a common practice that's based in evidence, that follows the World Health Model, that maybe we can change the outcome. What did they do? What was the impact of H1N1? Again, if it's predictable, in a large part it's preventable. But to do that, you need to work before it's into the system. And it doesn't take away or detract from what we do in the system. Because as John put it, I've spoken about this right across the country. You know what? We're not going to arrest our way out of our troubles as police, but we're not going to stop arresting. There's people, quite frankly, that need to go to jail. And the idea is we don't forget about them, but they're in a controlled environment and we've got great programs in our institutions in this province, Courage to Change, there's several of them. And we need to focus in relation to them. But how do we get the folks out of the system that are clogging it up? I hear all this talk about the omnibus bill and we're gonna have all this more people coming into our jails and then I travel across the country nationally and I'm on a justice reform commission and I realize that 60% of the inmates are on remand. Is there a process issue that we can deal with? Is there something that we can do to make the system better? Again, the sum is greater than the parts. And how can we collectively put our minds together to look at the whole picture? Well, the start is getting all the agencies in one room to talk about how things can be better. And that's what we've been fortunate to do in Prince Albert in relation to the Hub and Core. And uh, I'll get to a little bit of the results. But, Basically what we do, do in our particular world is foster innovation. Innovation is something that we see as probably, we don't want that in our, because that means change. But it doesn't, innovation in a business model means that you keep your core business. You need to know what you're good at. When I was in a franchise business in A&W's, I was told that you don't mess with the teen burger, the onion rings, and the, and the root beer. But everything else is up to have a little bit of debate on because you keep your staples of your business to be successful and you run what you're successful at and you use innovation to tweak your growth. Think about that. 
The hub in the core really is a franchise model. 24 4 to 48 hour response in the hub means that we don't pass it off to a committee, we don't phone six people, eight people later we're still passing it on a phone. We deliver results. The core is systemic issues. Let's look at what we have to change in policy. Let's write policy as a multi-agency group. Let's put doctorates in there. Let's get the best and brightest people in there and let's change those things that we need to tweak but let's get local solutions. And if you build the framework, it's just like a franchise. So if you're thinking of the first McDonald's or the first franchise, and we're gonna use McDonald's here in a minute, but think of it, a franchise was created because somebody had a great idea and they built it. His best friend come along and he wanted to do one in his home community, and you knew your best friend too well and you thought, wow, can't put him in charge of the hen house because it isn't gonna work. Reality is, is you can when the system's in place that there's a script to follow and that's what franchising does. So if you think of McDonald's, you think of Canada and you think of Japan, it's the same M, it's the same building, they look the same. Why? Because they've spent billions on franchising, they spent billions on their image. They have the same cooking systems, they have the same software systems, the margin for error is calculable. So if basically somebody's in there creating theft, if you look at numbers and you know how to run financial numbers, you can tell that. It takes away the chance of error. They have the same clown. But they have the ability to act local because they changed the menu. And that's really what we're doing. By giving us the ability to act local, giving us the ability to work on the menu that's going to impact change in your local community and allowing them to do the job by putting the right policy, the right framework, making sure that they have the legal obligations looked after, but at the end of the day, they start changing the landscape. And what John and his group have done in Scotland in six short years, if you haven't looked at it, start looking at it because they changed the landscape. And what I can tell you is him and I have had discussions and I think we're both working in synergy here and I think there's things that we connected that they do and we've tweaked it to meet what we need in Saskatchewan and what I can tell you in our hub and core is the Toronto Police Service was with through that two weeks ago I was in front of the editorial board of the Globe and Mail about four weeks ago we are getting noticed in Canada because we're doing something that is right in leadership in Saskatchewan under the leadership of the premier and some of the directions that he's obviously signing off is giving us the ability to lead change and if you don't think change is coming think again because at the end of the day if you look in the policing environment there's a strong relationship between the evolution of policing and the financial markets and the evolution of policing has a direct link to the financial market. So when there's a crisis in the financial market, policing's reinvented. Now we're in a perfect place in Saskatchewan because we're a little bit isolated from the crisis, but in UK they're not. And they're doing a lot of things that are getting it done on the right level because they're first through the door. Then there's the US who had basically, although they shouldn't have been surprised, were surprised and they're doing it by reaction. And at the end of the day, when you make decisions on reaction, a lot of times you don't make the right decisions. So we're in blue sky environment. We have the ability to change and tweak what we're doing to lead change. And I can tell you, after I said, being across the country, we're closer to leader, leading than we are following. And that's because of many of the bright people in this room. But if we really want to take it to another level, we got to tweak some of the things, in my opinion, that we're doing. Because if we get to the US model and we hit with crisis and all of a sudden the money's drying up, what's gonna happen is we're gonna go back to the expenditure philosophy and we're gonna chop, chop, chop. And we're gonna chop things that 10 years from now aren't gonna be acceptable. I always speak to a lot of youth when I travel. I coach soccer, I do many things in regards to youth because the reality is they're 30% of our population but they're 100% of our future. And quite frankly, we can't get this wrong. And if you look at the anomaly and you look at Prince Albert and you think Prince Albert, 32 to 42 percent of my arrests are from northern Saskatchewan. 32 to 40 percent of my workloads from outside my boundaries. And if you look at 50 percent of northern Saskatchewan is going to be under 15 in 8 to 10 years. And when I go to my board of police commissioners and I say we better get in the north today, do you think that's a good investment? Because when does the one-third become one-half? When does the one-third become 60%? And if you're talking about the taxpayer, the roads versus the social benefit cost, we better get on the page pretty quick because it's going to cost us a bundle. But what I can tell you after being in Scotland with 11 of my colleagues, this stuff is solvable. And if you don't think it's solvable, you shouldn't be in this room. Because 
Reality is 95% of this thing, I can tell you with certainty, 95% of certainty, we can fix our problems. The 5% is, is we're gonna make some mistakes. But the key is don't let the mistakes prevent you from doing the job, let the mistakes make you better. Because if we don't do anything, I could project where we're heading better than I can my RSPs right now because of the uncertain world economic times. We've got a lot of good people and we've got a lot of good things going and I think the future is really bright. And basically learning and innovation go hand in hand. The arrogance of success is to think what you did yesterday will be sufficient tomorrow. That's it, thanks.